Uh, if you want to go ahead and flip open to Isaiah 55, that's where I'm going to be. Uh, good morning to you all. It's a pleasure to speak to you. Um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to uh, hopefully share something that uh, may be of benefit to you in the midst of your work. And I want to begin by asking you guys two questions. Two questions I want to start by asking you. First off, how are you going to define the success of your revitalization or your church plant? How are you going to define the success of that work? And then secondly, what then do you believe you must do in order to see that success come about? Two questions. Just roll that around in your mind. That's more. What success? How are you going to see it come about? Well, I want to encourage you this morning to answer those questions by saying that the Word of God will define your success. And therefore, the word of God will then orient your week, how you go about your week. That doesn't sound very revolutionary, uh, but I do think it's important for us to think about. So that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, about having a word-centered view of planting or revitalizing. And in particular, I want to encourage you to let the word of God define your success and then therefore orient the way you go about your week. So there are a lot of voices, right, floating around in our heads and in our hearts uh, about how things ought to go, trying to convince us to listen to those voices. And so we need, brothers and sisters, we need to let the word of God speak the loudest. And therefore, we need to let the word of God guide us in the things that we put on our calendars every single week. And so we need to let that speak. So what you're going to see is if we let that word of God speak the loudest, most regularly, what we're going to see is if you do that, you're going to be able to have a lot of confidence when things may not be appearing to, go, to be going so well. We do that. So uh, just a, bit, a little bit about me and my family. We moved up here uh, to Washington, D.C., as Mark mentioned, and we had more than one person tell us that what we planned to do was strange in terms of the way in which we're going about it. Bill's not one of those people, just for the record. Uh, he's here. He was part of our help us at work. But uh, there were people that thought the way that we were going about it was strange. And the reason why they thought it was strange was because of the way in which we decided we were going to go into this community to bring about life on a dead part of the city. Uh, and the way in which we said we were going to do things is we're, we said we're going to preach the Bible and try to help people obey it. That was pretty much our plan. So as God is my witness, we were not trying to be cavalier about this. We weren't trying to say, look at us. You know, we were not trying to thumb our noses at the church growth specialists or things like that. We simply didn't have the kinds of teachers and the kind of books put in our hands to make us think any differently. Uh, instead, we were influenced by a couple of professors at our seminary, uh, our pastors in our local church there in North Carolina, and eventually by the ministry of uh, Nine Marks. Uh, we were not from the city, Washington, D.C. We had never, we didn't have any friends here in this city. We'd never lived in a big city like this before. We had no existing relationships here in D.C. Uh, if you don't know, it cost a gazillion dollars to live in D.C., especially in our part of this city. Uh, most people in Northwest D.C., as Mark was referencing, they could care less about the biblical Jesus. And so we had all of these things sort of going against us. So you can imagine what it was like when we uh, would talk to church planning organizations and things like that, when they asked us how we were going to go about things, and we told them that we were going to try to meet people, share the word of God with them, and hopefully call them to obey Jesus by obeying the Bible. Now you can imagine they thought very little of us, or again, they thought that we were strange. So uh, I'm sure that some people thought that we were naive, and they may have been right, uh, in that assessment. Uh, but we were dumb enough to believe that if we built our work on the word of God, then something good would happen. We really actually were committed to that. I can remember thinking in those earlier days that if we tried to obey the Bible, preach the Bible, pray the Bible, sing the Bible, and if nothing happened, then we could be very confident that no matter what it was, that's exactly what God wanted to have happen. So as opposed to building our work on something maybe like more akin to marketing principles that might endeavor to gather a crowd quickly, and if it didn't go well then, then I think it would be more difficult to deal with the consequences if it didn't go well, because it would have been built more off of what we were trying to do, as it were. And so brothers, as Mark mentioned, I'm, I'm here to testify to you some seven and a half years later 
that the existence of Restoration Church in North De- Northwest DC is a testimony to the fact that the word of God really does not return void. But instead, it really does accomplish the purposes for which God intends. And so let me just say to this, I realize that not, the Lord will not necessarily work in the midst of your planting or your revitalizing the same way he did with us. I recognize that. But we can be confident, right, that it will accomplish whatever purposes for which happen in your lives as you faithfully preach and sow the word. And so I believe, guys, I believe that he will work amongst your planting, amongst your efforts, amongst your revitalizing. If you centrally are sowing the word, I believe that God will do what it is he promised, he said he would do with that word. So I want, that's what I want us to think about this morning. But before I get into thinking about centrally sowing the word, I do, think, I do think it would be important for us to at least make ourselves aware of another kind of ministry that will attempt to persuade you in the work of planting or revitalizing. A ministry that certainly does not want to disparage the word, but a ministry in its practice that will persuade you to believe that its principles will get you what you want more easily. So we should at least be familiar with that. And so I've become more aware of this ministry by reading and by listening to others that are part of this ministry. And what I've found is that underneath these other models, there are three things that are often assumed, but rarely, if ever, addressed. Three things in these other kinds of ministries uh, that are rarely addressed, but often assumed. And those three ideas are size, speed, and self-sustainability. Size, speed, and self-sustainability. Most any church planning uh, book or church growth sort of book, talk, they kind of assume those three things, that namely that we all want as much numerical size as we can get, as fast as we can get it. And when we do that, uh, when we do that, we can then be self-sustainable and not need outside support. And once all those three things happen, then success has happened. Now, that last one may not mark you revitalizers as much, this whole self-sustainable thing, but I think it bears mentioning for us uh, that are planting in particular. So let me go ahead right from the top here and let me affirm all three of those things to a degree, right? I want more people. I don't want less people, right? And I generally like those people to come more quickly than I would slowly, right? And I'd, I'd like to not need money from outside, the, you know, outside of our own church. I'd like to be able to be self-sustainable. So all those things are not wrong in and of themselves. But what I want to suggest is that these things can't be the primary drivers. They can't be the primary drivers, the primary voices that we're listening to and being guided by. Because if they are, they're going to define success and therefore orient the way we go about our week. We need something deeper, something better we can set our feet on in the midst of every week in order to do this difficult work of revitalizing or planting. We need something that won't shift with marketing trends or the ever-changing palettes of the peoples in our neighborhoods. We need something that we can have confidence in. Just like that farmer is confident that planting a seed in the ground will get him food if the rain comes, we need something confident that we can sow in the ground, plant in the ground of our communities, knowing and believing that fruit will eventually come in some way, shape, or form. And if we don't, if we don't sow that word centrally, and if we assume that size and speed are the governing factors in getting us where we want to go, then they are going to define our success and orient our week in the similar way to starting or revitalizing an old business. So, but brothers, we're not trying to revitalize an old Sears store. We're trying to revitalize or plant a church of the living God. And that's got to inform the way that we think and the way that we go about our weeks. So it's right, let me say this from the top. You saw the title there of my talk. Let me say this from the top, that it's right and good to hand out flyers, to do block parties, to do large outreach events. We've done those things. We still do those things from time to time. We've done all of those, but we are not going to let the size of these things and the speed at which they come to us define our work and orient our weeks because we don't have promises attached to marketing, but we do have God-ordained promises that are attached to preaching. And that's where I want to encourage you, brothers, uh, in the work of revitalizations. Give yourself to the ministry of the word and let that voice define success and orient your week. So again, we're going to be in Isaiah 55, and I want to make five observations about a word-centered ministry, what a word-centered ministry will give you. Five things that we can learn to define the success of your work and therefore orient the way you go about your week. 
So there in Isaiah 55, let me set the context for us. We've got that wonderful gospel-rich uh, chapter in Isaiah 53 right right in front of us, uh, this beautiful uh, gospel rehearsal there in 53. And then in chapter 54, we get the benefits of the, those that trust that gospel in chapter 54. And then in chapter 55, we get some admonitions in light of those gospel benefits to seek the Lord while he may be found. You can see that there in verse 6. So then we could ask the question, well, how is it we might seek the Lord? Where might we seek the Lord? Where might we go to enjoy these benefits? Well, I think that's where verse 10 and 11 break in of chapter 55. This is what it says. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Five things. Five things a word-centered ministry will give you. The first thing that a word-centered ministry will give you is power. There's power, power in the word. So we should let that power of the word define our success and orient our weeks. Because, brothers, we have a promise from the living God there in verse 11 that it shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which he purposes. It shall succeed in the thing for which he sent. There's power in that word. So have you ever seen the rain not deliver water to the thirsty? Have you ever seen rain not give life to wheat so that we could eat See, farmers, again, know these things, and so their lives are dictated by those promises. They've got some man-made enhancers. Maybe they want to throw some miracle grow in there and make the thing sprout better, right? But ultimately, their whole lives are guided by the rain falling to the earth and giving life. And so they can be sure that that has always happened, and therefore it will happen. And so it gives them confidence to get out of the bed every morning and plant seeds in the ground. So, brothers, we need the same kind of confidence that that farther farmer has in the rain and in the grain. Same kind of confidence that the farmer has. So we, we, we have to not just say that we trust the power of the word to accomplish God's purposes. We have to live as though that's true by having it define our success in orienting our weeks. So there's a great little equation that we use around the life of our church, and it goes like this. Stated belief plus actual practice equals actual belief. Stated belief plus actual practice equals actual belief. See, I can say that I believe airplanes take people safely to other destinations, but I do not show that faith, I do not show that confession until I hop on a plane, right, and get there. So in the same way, you can say that you trust the word of God to bring about power, but you do not actually reveal your actual belief unless you're actually doing that, essentially doing that. Stated belief plus actual practice equals actual belief. You can say that the word of God has the power to, t to accomplish holiness and transformation in the lives of people, but unless you preach it and spread it generously in the soul of your people's heart, you've not made good on that confession. So a few years ago, I, I heard a story from Ian Murray talking about the ministry of Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he tells this wonderful story about how, I think it was a believer, brings an unbeliever to listen to Lloyd-Jones preach one night. And at the conclusion of that event, the unbeliever says to the believer about Lloyd-Jones that he was a very arrogant man, Lloyd-Jones. And if you've heard Lloyd-Jones preach, you can understand why he might say that. And the believer, though, says back to the unbeliever, no, no, no. He's not arrogant at all. His confidence is not in himself. His confidence is in the word of God. And brothers, that's how we must be. We must do the same thing. That's where our confidence has to be. So when we came up here to Washington, D.C., me and Joey, we believe the promises here that are found in Isaiah 55. When we started our work, we preached what were probably terrible hour-long sermons. And they might still not be so good from week to week. Uh, we did that. We preached these text-based sermons. And we did more than though just preach on Sundays. We started meeting with whoever would let us meet with them. And we would open up the Bible and just walk through it. Or we would re read books that sort of were centered on the Scripture. And guess what happened? Life came. 
life came. People began to believe. We saw quite a number of people that thought they believed. Actually, lights began to go off and go, actually, I never actually studied the book of Mark for myself and see the book is actually claiming that Jesus is the Lord, and I need to follow that. But that came by just having the word of God put in front of the face of these people. And so time and time again, people would come to our apartment. That's right, my apartment to hear me preach. How weird is that, right? Bill's been in that apartment before. He helped me find it. I'm literally standing in my apartment preaching. Weird, cultish maybe, wasn't intended to be, but people week after week would come. And the reason why I think they would come is not because they were coming to listen to me, but because so much of the sermon was soaked with God. So they came to listen to him. And so after all, right, who really cares what a recently seminary, uh, a recent seminary graduate thinks? It's only lived in the city for a matter of months. I mean, who really cares what I think? If they knew that there was something that it was attended to. If the word of God was sent to it, they would get to hear God. And because they got to hear from God, like many of you, we've been able to see and witness the promises of God for accomplishing the purposes for which he sent it. And so if in the work of revitalization, you give yourself to a word-centered ministry in your preaching and in your discipling, then you can be confident that the powerful promises of God will attend your work, whatever that may be, however it manifests itself. So therefore, brothers, let the powerful word of God define your ministries and orient how you go about your week. But the word of God is not only powerful, but it also provides, secondly, patterns. I'm going to alliterate, guys. I don't never do this. So... Hopefully, this is helpful for you. So we've seen powers in the Word, but also a word center ministry will give you patterns. Now, I'm going to jump out of Isaiah 55 here for just a minute, but I can remember saying to my friends that the Bible doesn't really have much to say about the way we go about church. I remember saying that. And I took a class on my first semesters from Dr. John Hammett, great professor, and he walked us through these various patterns in Scripture about the church. And I saw them, lights begin to go off for me. And then he mentioned halfway through the semester that he had a friend named Mark Dever in Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. I'd never heard of him. And so I came up here, first seminary, first year seminary student, walked up here, came in and did a weekend or that first week. Now you can imagine, I had no idea what I was getting myself in. Imagine walking into a weekender, not knowing what was going to happen. Well, needless to say, I was shocked. But what happened, though, is by the end of the time of that weekender, I saw the patterns of Scripture about the beauty of the local church and the way things should be going through Scripture. And then, then at the weekender, I saw the visible manifestation of that here in the weekender. And after that, it began to materialize for me. I began to see that the Bible has these various patterns if we would only take the time to see them and investigate them. And now it's sort of like those paint or those pictures. Do you remember those pictures where you had to sort of look at them and stare at them cross-eyed in order to see those patterns jump out? Do you remember those? You know, now it's sort of like that with me. Or maybe the FedEx symbol. You know, you guys know there's an arrow in the FedEx symbol? Now I can't not see that arrow. If you don't know that, take a look at it when you go. Next time you see it walking around, you can't not see that arrow. So in the same way, when we begin to see that there's these patterns in Scripture, you can't unsee them. They're all over the place throughout Scripture. So the word of God gives us more patterns than we realize if only we had eyes to see them. So I'm going to give you three, three patterns that maybe you wouldn't notice uh, in Scripture unless you were slowing down long enough to pay attention to them. Three patterns that will help define our success and orient our weeks. Did you know that there's a pattern in the Bible for short-term missions? Did you know that? I could give you a few places, but let me give you one. Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 to 18. This is what it says, Paul writing, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. And I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And so here, guys, we have a local church in Philippi sending Epaphroditus to Paul, where, is he, where he's imprisoned in Rome, who's still doing the work of the gospel. And this gift was encouraging and helpful to him in his work. 
And so that orients how and why we at Restoration Church, for instance, go about our mission trips. It helps us understand. We've got a couple uh, in the Middle East uh, that there that is working amongst an unreached people group. And we, from that passage and a couple of others, we learned how we're gonna go about doing our short-term mission trips. And because of that, we've seen quite a number of fruit, in particular, the, imper- the, incor- the importance of encouraging the workers on the field. See, most of you sort of think, oh, we should go do evangelism when we go over to those on those short-term trips. But did you ever think about going over just to encourage the workers and to help them to keep going? Well, that seems to be a pattern that we see in Philippians 4. Let me give you another one. Did you know that there's a pattern for something akin to, say, the North American Mission Board? 2 Corinthians 8, chapter 1, or chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Listen to this. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Now here, we do not find a parachurch organization, but we do see a pattern in the word that tells us that it's good to partner with other churches for the sake of mission. So that then helped us understand maybe it's a good idea to help support the Southern Baptist Convention. We're also part of something called the Treasuring Christ Together Network. And so we do that in order to facilitate church planting and help other church plants. And where do we find that pattern? Well, it's right there in 2 Corinthians 8. If we would slow down long enough to see that there are patterns to help us know how to define success and orient our weeks. Let me give you another one. Church membership. This is a common one. If around these parts, you've been to a nine marks weekend or a conference, you've probably heard this before, but uh, did you know that there are patterns in scripture that actually help us, help us understand something about church membership, namely that it's there, that it's present, and it's important. We train our folks at Restoration Church in five ways that the church gives us patterns in scripture for church membership, five ways. The first one is church discipline. So if you can kick somebody out of a church, that would seem to indicate that there's a pattern there that you have to be meaningfully a part of a local church. The second thing that we teach our folks is, that, is of the 40 plus one another's in the Bible, right? Love one another, forgive one another, all these things. So it seems to indicate that if you're a Christian, you've got to have some definable group of people by which you're obeying those passages with. A third one that we see there is the metaphors about the church be it the house or a marriage or a body. All these things are meaningfully put together if we slow down long enough to see that. If you see a cut off finger in a jar, you know something bad happened, right? And the fourth or the fifth, actually the fourth and the fifth one is sort of a two for one. Hebrews 13, 17. We find that leaders are giving account for people. So I say to people sometimes like, is it my responsibility according to Hebrews 13, 17 to give an account for every Christian on planet earth? And they'll be like, oh no, of course not. Okay, what about every Christian in America? Oh, sure, no, 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 you don't even know all the Christians in America. Okay, what about all the Christians in the district? Oh, no, 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 probably not. What about all the Christians in Northwest DC? Well, no, okay, then who? Am I supposed to give an account for even everyone that kind of strolls in and out of the church in which I pastor and preach? No, there's gotta be a particular definable group of people. And then the other one on the other side of that in Hebrews 13, 17, is we find that people are obeying leaders. Well, I'll ask, go through the same exercise. Well, do you need to pay attention and submit to every pastor on the earth? No, walk on down. So we find patterns in the scripture for church membership if we would slow down long enough to see them. I could give you so many more. We can think about expository preaching, right? Acts chapter seven, Stephen's preaching, just walking through the biblical timeline. I could give you uh, patterns for outreach when Jesus sends people out two by two. There seems wisdom in that. So brothers, there are so many patterns in the word of God that can help us to define success and therefore orient the way we go about our week. But let me give you another one. Two things we've seen so far that a word-centered ministry gives you. It gives you power. It gives you patterns. Thirdly, it gives you pleasures. Pleasures. Go back to Isaiah 55. I want you to notice there what comes immediately after the promises of God's purposes being accomplished through his word. Did you notice what comes right after it? Look there at verse 12, chapter 55. You'll notice that first word, for. See, whatever is going to come next is rising out of the promises there in verses 10 and 11. It's connected to that. The word word of God is going to accomplish its purposes. Verse 12, for you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. 
The mountains and hills before you shall break forth into singing and all of the fields shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. So the Lord promises to, he promises the word to accomplish its purpose as it goes out. And clearly a part of this purpose is to bring about joy, to bring about peace, to bring about restoration of God's people. And so I wonder, brothers, how many times have you preached the word of God with an explicit view of helping your people see that the word of God is the pathway to pleasure? How many times have you done that? I'm sure that you believe that God is joyful in these kinds of things, but do you preach, do you teach, do you disciple people to help them see from the text that obeying God's word will bring them into joy. And it is obedience to God's word is the pathway to the good life. A couple books, suggestions that I I would encourage you. Matthew Henry has a good book on this, The Pleasantness of the Religious religious Life. He meditates on Proverbs 3. Uh, There's another little book, Owen Strain and uh, a guy named Sweeney, meditating on Jonathan Edwards' book, um, Ideas, uh, called The Good Life. Really helpful for this. Are you helping your people see that obeying the scripture Obeying the scripture is the pathway to pleasure. That seems to be the indication that we see there in Isaiah 55. And so brothers, you're going to be tempted, if you're not already, to give yourself to more creative ideas to bring about joy and life in the church. But you have to see and you have to help your people to see that the more you give yourself to the word of God, the more that you will come to live in the joy of God. I had a pastor recently of over 10 years, He's been, he's pastor for over 10 years. He told me the other day that he'd never taught this to his people. He'd never helped them understand that God's word was the pathway to, ple- to pleasure. He believed that, but he never actually took the time to actually do that. And so guys, there's so many things in our lives right now trying to convince us that they are the pathway to pleasure but none of them come with the promises like this one where the God of the universe says that as his word goes out, a result of that is joy and peace. And guys, I wonder, how many people in your churches want joy and peace? How many of them do? Well, if you make your ministry centered on the word, you can be confident that they can and will find it there in the scriptures. And I mentioned restoration Isn't that what you're trying to do, you revitalizers? Isn't that what you're trying to do? I mean, look again there at verse 13, 55, 13. The language there of thorn being replaced by cypress and the briar being replaced by the myrtle, that's the language of revitalization. So a lot of you have some thorns and briars in these churches you're trying to revitalize, don't you? Amen? Well, brothers, right here is your answer. Give them a healthy diet of God's word and life will come. Don't just preach it to them. Show them the word is the pathway to pleasure. And this has been one of the most revolutionary things, I think, in the minds of our members at Restoration Church. They, many of them come to our church and they never really understood that the scriptures were the pathway to pleasure. And so that's given them an even greater appetite for the word as we've shown them the beauty of the word and how it's bringing about restoration in not only their lives, but in the lives of our church as a whole and even in our communities. So instead of trying to feed them with fatty foods and self-help or personal growth kinds of preaching, they now want the word because many of them are seeing where life is found. And you wanna know what's an absolute tragedy? What is an absolute tragedy? Our people and the peoples in our communities believe there's more pleasure in porn than there is in the word of God. And yet we find the very opposite to be true. God's word is the pathway to pleasure. God gives us promises to that. And so give yourselves to defining your work and orienting your week by the pleasures of God and his word and not the fleeting pleasure of maybe quick growth principles. Fourth thing that a word-centered ministry gives you is the passion, passion of the word. So this passage promises that the word will accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. We see that part of that purpose is our joy and the restoration of all things. That's verse 12. And then look what comes next in verse 13. And it, that's the joy and the restoration, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Isn't it great to know, brothers, that our joy and the restoration of all things do not have to compete with the exaltation of the glory of God? 
Praise the Lord that that is true. So if you define the success of your revitalization or your plant by the word, and if you then orient yourselves to the word, not only do you get power and patterns and pleasures, you get the passion of the word, which is making a name for God, the glory of God. See, if we spend too much time thinking creatively for the goal of size and speed, we may easily miss the passion of what we're doing, namely making a name for the Lord. But if we steep ourselves, orient ourselves, give ourselves to the word, we will exalt the name that is above all names. See, it's not very difficult, guys, to gather a crowd under the banner of making a name for your heroes, peers, or even yourself. That's not that difficult to do. All, right, all you have to do is raise the volume of your music, tell a lot of jokes, and make Jesus the helper to their individual dreams. And you'll get a crowd. You'll get a crowd. People will come. They'll want to hear things like that. Self-improvement kinds of preaching, good entertainment, that gathers crowds. But word-centered preaching will make a people. And they may not be very large. May not be very large, but they will do what God made them to do, namely to make a name for him. Make a name for him. So you give yourself to the regular diet of the word, and that's going to come. Life is going to come as the passion of God and his glory is exalted through your preaching, through your discipling. But lastly, brothers, you need this last one. You've got to have this last one. Word-centered ministry gives you these things, but it also is going to give you patience. Patience. It's going to give you a lot of patience, and don't we need patience? Amen? Have mercy. <laughs> So if you, if you make the word define success, orient your week, you will have power. You'll get those patterns you should run in. You'll have pleasure. You'll have the passion for which the world exists. But brother, word-centered ministry will also make you patient. Look at the very next verse in Isaiah 56, 1. Say 56, 1. Thus says the Lord, keep justice, do righteousness, for soon my salvation. Did you catch that? For soon my salvation will come and my righteousness will be revealed. You guys know when the book of Isaiah was written, Paul Parkett, about 700 B.C., somewhere in there, 700 B.C., and it wasn't then for another 700 years that the salvation came. And yet, how does the Lord describe it? Isaiah 56, 1, soon my salvation will come. 700 years later, the Lord is not in much of a hurry, folks. And so I would refer you, if you've not, I know Mark mentioned there was a lot of you that weren't at T4G, I would refer you to Mark's excellent message about a slow reformation. It was a helpful word. So word-centered ministry is not flashy. It won't typically bring you a lot of speedy success as others may define it, but it will bring you to success as the Lord defines it. In his own timing, in his own way. One of my pastors used to tell us all the time as we were going through a church planning residency, he would tell us the Lord is rarely early, but he's never late. Never late. And so if you want an easier path, then don't do much of what we're talking about this morning. Go out and build your ministry on making a name for yourself. Trust those kind of marketing principles to gather a crowd. But if you want to make a name for the Lord, then give yourselves to a word-centered ministry in preaching on Sundays, in discipling on Tuesdays, and evangelizing on Saturdays. And it may not look like anything is happening, but brother, something is happening. You have a promise from the Lord that it is. I come home every single day. I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old boy. I come home every day. When I leave them in the morning, when I come home in in the evening, they look exactly the same every single day. But the reality is they're changing. They're changing. They're growing. Every single day they are. And you know how I see that? You know how I know that? I don't see it in the day-to-day. But the way in which I see it is I go back and look at pictures of my sons one year ago, two years ago, three years ago. And then I see, gosh, they've changed so much in the last year. But I don't really see it right in front of me in the day-to-day. Brothers, the same is true of our churches. You may not see the growth. You may not see the change. But insofar as you're feeding them the word, just like I'm feeding food to my kids Change is coming. Carefully, regularly feed your people the word. And while it may not look and feel like something has happened, believe it is. 
Because God promised you that it will. It will accomplish his purposes, whatever that looks like. Give it time and do it as the Lord wills and he promises to bring that growth about. Don't let size and speed define your success or orient your weeks. Let the word of God do that. And as you do, you can be assured that your revitalization, your plant will be attended with power to accomplish the will of God, patterns to guide you in the work of God, pleasures to sweeten you as you go, a passion to see the Lord glorified and patience to see fruit come how the Lord allows. Let me leave you with this. Final word, 2 Timothy chapter four. A familiar passage to many of you in this room. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you give us a word that you make so clear to us. There's a promise is attached to that word that it will accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. It will succeed. God, may I and the brothers and sisters in this room give ourselves to your word, believing, trusting that your purposes will come about. Let us not be swayed, Father. Let us not be swayed by the things that might get us more easily, the kinds of things that we would like. Lord, let us be like Abraham and Sarah. Let us not try and go get Hagar. Let us trust that in due time, your promise will succeed. Thank you, God, for the many ways in which it has, and thank you for Jesus. It makes it all possible. We pray in his name.